Please stand by. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Stitch Fix fourth quarter 2022 earnings call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Hayden Blair. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today to discuss the results for Stitch Fix's fourth quarter and full year 2022. Joining me on the call today are Elizabeth Spaulding, CEO of Stitch Fix, and Dan Jetta, CFO. We have posted complete fourth quarter and full year 2022 financial results in a press release on the quarterly results section of our website, investors.stitchfix.com. A link to the webcast of today's conference call can also be found on our site. We would like to remind everyone that we will be making forward-looking statements on this call, which involve risks and uncertainties. Actual results could differ materially from those contemplated by our forward-looking statements. Reported results should not be considered as an indication of future performance. Please review our filings with the SEC for a discussion of the factors that could cause the results to differ. In particular, our press release issued and filed today, as well as the risk factors sections of our quarterly report on Form 10-Q for our third quarter previously filed with the SEC, and the annual report on Form 10-K for fiscal year 2022, which we expect to be filed tomorrow. Also note that the forward-looking statements on this call are based on information available to us as of today's date. We disclaim any obligation to update any forward-looking statements except as required by law. During this call, we will discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliations to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures are provided in the press release on our investor relations website. These non-GAAP measures are not intended to be a substitute for our GAAP results. Finally, this call in its entirety is being webcast on our investor relations website, and a replay of this call will be available on the website shortly. With that, I will turn the call over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Hayden, and thank you all for joining us for Stitch Fix's Q4 2022 earnings call. FY22 was a pivotal year for Stitch Fix as we embarked on a significant transformation with the full rollout of Freestyle. Freestyle, combined with our original Fix offering, broadens our ecosystem and our ability to solve the hardest consumer shopping and styling problems, fit, discovery, and human relationships. These differentiators remain as relevant as ever as we provide our clients with the right product at the right time. We learned a lot over the course of FY22, and we are building on our areas of progress. In this challenging macroeconomic environment, and as we continue to work through our transformation, we recognize that returning to profitability is of utmost importance. This is our top priority. This will happen by both returning to active client growth and by optimizing our cost base. We are pleased with the progress that we made in Q4 on right-sizing our cost base, and we are on track to exceed the top end of our expected annual savings in FY23. Today, I will first provide details on our financial performance in Q4 and FY22. Then I will discuss how we are building on our learnings from this past year to drive net active clients and improve how we operate the business for both scale and profitability. Dan will then share more details on our cost management and productivity efforts. First on our financials, the realities of record inflation levels and a deteriorating retail landscape resulted in slower discretionary spend in apparel and presented us with an increasingly challenging fourth quarter, particularly in June and July. Q4 net revenue declined 16% year over year to 482 million, driven by a 9% year over year decline in net active clients, which ended FY22 at 3.8 million. Adjusted EBITDA in the quarter was negative 31.8 million. Revenue per active client grew 8% year-over-year to $546 in the fourth quarter. Looking at our full FY22, net revenue declined 1% year-over-year 
to $2.1 billion, along with an adjusted EBITDA loss of $19.5 million. Despite this, freestyle revenue grew 21% year over year, with penetration from our fixed client base steadily increasing since its launch. Now, let me share more on our go-forward strategy for FY23. First, we're capitalizing on the health of our existing customer base by nourishing our core differentiators and improving our unique experience. Second, we're focused on net active client growth by broadening our marketing portfolio, refining the onboarding experience to capture both new and prospective clients, and targeting strategies that re-engage previously active clients. And finally, we're committed to managing our costs efficiently and strengthening our infrastructure in order to build a profitable business that is ripe for future expansion. Starting on the first point, we know we win when our clients feel heard, when we send the right item based on personal preference and fit, and when we push style boundaries in new ways. Our powerful combination of data science and creative human judgment has enabled us to ship over 75 million fixes and to fulfill over 10 million freestyle orders to date. We also know that the first few experiences with Stitch Fix represent a critical opportunity to build a long-term relationship and keep our clients coming back for more. In FY23, building on our strength of listening and responding to requests and meeting the moment, we are evolving our stylist request notes to include the ability to add specific occasions so that our stylists can deliver stronger choices in these discovery moments. We also plan to insert more opportunities to collaborate with our stylist community in real time. Additionally, we're working to deliver a diverse assortment that showcases our varying price points, especially in a time when consumers are more cost conscious. We believe these efforts will drive higher engagement and further cement Stitch Fix as the go-to online styling partner for both current and future customers. On to the second point. We recognize that reigniting the active client flywheel is vital for growth. We know that success will not only come through new client activation, but also through prospective clients and re-engaging clients who haven't shopped with us for over 12 months. In September, we released our first ever multinational brand campaign with the goal of communicating how Stitch Fix works and celebrating the personalization that we deliver. While traffic improved through the second half of FY22, we expect this campaign to drive a sizable increase in impressions across TV, paid social, and branded content partnerships, and by building brand awareness, will increase traffic to our ecosystem. We also launched an affiliate influencer network in early August. Though small today, we plan to scale quickly with the goal of incorporating our stylists throughout FY23 as a way to tap more into our unique differentiators. And lastly, over the course of FY22, we made improvements post the freestyle launch to get conversion to a better place since its low point earlier in the year, and we're making further investments in the client onboarding journey to drive conversion rates even higher. These investments include style quiz simplification and seamless login experiences in order to reduce barriers to entry and more immediately show how we serve client interests. We also have many prospective clients who have given us information but have yet to convert, and many who haven't shopped with us for over 12 months, both of which represent opportunities for re-engagement. We're approaching these moments of re-engagement with new strategies given our expanded offering. As an example, we are enhancing our email programs to include algorithmically generated product previews that better showcase our inventory and are leveraging more stylist centric messaging and content. On the third and final point on enabling profitable growth and expansion. In the near term, and as Dan will share more, we are taking a variety of important actions to continue to improve our free cash flow. More broadly, 
we are focused on developing our infrastructure to drive profitable growth and support our future expansion. With our tech infrastructure, we're investing in our structured data platforms and more modular architecture to enable faster launch of new client features. We're also innovating on our core algorithms to allow for dynamic engagement and real-time styling. With this complex work well underway, we're confident in our technology strategy. By evolving our underlying infrastructure, we're creating a stable foundation for scale and are setting the stage for profitable growth in FY24. I'd like to conclude by thanking our team for all their hard work and innovating on behalf of our customers. We will continue to adapt as needed to build value for our shareholders without losing sight of the customer-centric culture that defines Stitch Fix. I'm proud of the team that we've built, the strategy we have now set in place, and I feel encouraged by what this next chapter brings for Stitch Fix. We're clear-eyed about the current challenges that the macro environment presents, and we remain focused on the key initiatives discussed today in order to deliver exceptional shopping and styling experiences to our clients and to achieve profitability in the future. With that, I will turn the call over to Dan. Thanks, Elizabeth, and hello to everyone joining us on today's call. As Elizabeth discussed, our business is undergoing a significant transformation, which we are pushing forward in FY23. At the same time, we recognize the challenges presented by the current macro environment, and as such, we continue to direct our business in a financially responsible manner. In Q4, we generated net revenue of $482 million, down 16% year-over-year, driven by softness in fixed volume, which was partially offset by demand in freestyle. July was especially challenging, in tandem with macroeconomic deterioration throughout the summer months, and as consumer discretionary spend pulled back from apparel. Notably, these trends have continued in the first half of Q1. Active clients ended Q4 down 3% sequentially and 9% year-over-year at $3.8 million. Q4 gross margin was 40%, driven largely by increased inventory reserves and higher liquidations to the excess spring and summer goods. Adjusting for this increase in our inventory reserve and higher liquidations, gross margin was 42.5%, a decline of about 400 basis points from a year ago. This reduction is primarily due to tightening product margins from rising inflation and increased penetration of national brands, as well as an increase in transportation costs. Sequentially, gross margin was flat once adjusting for the increased inventory reserves and higher liquidations. Turning to inventory, we ended Q4 with net inventory down 7% year over year and down 7% quarter over quarter to 197 million. We took action in the quarter to right size our inventory through our July limited sales event and third-party liquidations, which focused on moving spring and summer product. Looking ahead, we are continuing our efforts to right-size our inventory position to be in line with demand. For any excess inventory, we'll look at utilizing limited sales events, continuing to use third-party liquidators, and delaying inbound receipts or holding inventory based on the right economic decision. We will likely continue to see elevated inventory levels in the first half of our fiscal year, but we expect to see lower levels relative to demand in the back half. Advertising was just under 10% of net revenue in Q4, slightly down over Q3, but up 390 basis points versus the same quarter last year. For the full year FY22, advertising represented approximately 9% of net revenue. For FY23, we expect maintain levels of spend at around 9% of net revenue as we grow the virality of Stitch Fix, as well as continue to improve on our core performance marketing channels and expand into newer channels such as SEM, influencers, and affiliates. Moving on to adjusted EBITDA. Q4 adjusted EBITDA was negative 32 million. This excluded 26 million in restructuring and other one-time charges. We ended Q4 with no debt and $231 million in cash, cash equivalents, and highly rated securities, as well as an undrawn $100 million revolving line of credit. 
Now on to our outlook. There are a number of factors impacting the predictability of our forecast. As we turn the page on FY22, we are focused on the goal of achieving adjusted EBITDA profitability and positive free cash flow. Our path to profitability consists of customer-centric actions intended to grow active clients, increasing leverage and gross margin, improving fixed and variable productivity, and driving positive free cash flow. Elizabeth discussed our focus and actions on driving active clients. On gross margin, we expect both Q1 and full year gross margin to be around 42%, primarily reflecting an improved inventory position and expected lower transportation costs versus the fourth quarter of FY22. SG&A, excluding advertising and stock-based compensation, was down 8% sequentially and essentially flat year over year when excluding restructuring and one-time charges. While we are pleased with our expense control in Q4, we will continue to focus on reducing fixed costs and improving variable productivity. As we optimize our cost structure, we will continue to evaluate our real estate footprint and prioritize our investment in product and technology. With these efforts in place, we are on track to exceed the high end of 40 to 60 million in expected annual cost savings we discussed last quarter. In addition to cost savings, we are also focused on driving towards positive free cash flow and expect to improve our overall cash conversion cycle in FY23 by right-sizing inventory, extending vendor terms, and investing in CapEx with near-term positive ROI. Moving to our outlook, it's important to note that lower active clients in FY22 will have an impact on revenue, particularly in the first half of the fiscal year. With this in mind, we expect total revenue to be between 1.76 and 1.86 billion for full year FY23. We will manage the business towards a goal of being adjusted EBITDA and free cash flow positive sometime in FY23. For the full year FY23, we expect adjusted EBITDA to be between negative 45 and negative 25 million. Moving on to Q1. Largely due to the dynamics previously discussed on the current state of net active clients and the associated ongoing impact of macro challenges, we expect Q1 revenue to be between 455 and 465 million. Due to our ongoing efforts in reducing our cost structure, we expect Q1 adjusted EBITDA will substantially improve versus Q4 of FY22 and be negative 15 million to negative 10 million. This guidance assumes net active clients will be down quarter over quarter, but less so than the sequential change between Q3 and Q4. As we reinforced multiple times during this call, we are laser focused on our return to profitability. We recognize the importance of building a solid foundation so that we can grow from a position of strength. This will be achieved by a return to net active client growth and continuing to optimize our cost structure. With that, I'd like to turn the call over to the operator for Q&A. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. In order to allow time for additional analysts to ask their questions, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up question before re-entering the queue. Again, press star 1 to ask a question. We will take our first question from Yousef Squally with Truist Securities. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Um, hi, guys. Just a quick, uh, two quick questions for me. One. Maybe um, can you just speak to the onboarding process and improvements you've made there? Obviously, you're deciding to increase your marketing, um, which would lead me to believe that you believe that your onboarding process and conversion rates, et cetera, um, have improved relative to where, where they were th even three months ago. Um, so maybe maybe uh, any any kind of quantification of where we are in that process would be really helpful. And then as you look at the business beyond 2023, and I know there are a lot of moving parts here, but relative to kind of how you guys looked at the business, um, uh, I guess you know a couple of years ago, what kind of 
growth do you think this business can support? Um, you know, all things considered, looking at the TAM changes, et cetera, is this still, you know, kind of a double-digit business, uh, double-digit growth business, do you feel, or, or is that something that now we need to, to adjust as we think through the opportunity? Thank you. Hey, Yusuf, thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, on the first point, you know, we've made a lot of progress on conversion over the last couple of quarters, and, um, you know, we, we have seen a return to levels that we had seen in the past. That said, we believe we can still make progress and upside in some of the consumer pain points that we know of. Um, you know, we made it easier to get back into our fixed experience. We've made improvements in iterative testing on, you know, more of an understanding of what Stitch Fix is about. We know it's a an unusual service, and so we've done, I think, a lot of good iterative improvements on making that easy for clients to understand. You know, that said, we still see opportunity to make it um, even easier to get inside in terms of seamless login. Um, we still provide kind of that step where you have to provide your email up front. And so all of those are areas we're going to keep working on. So we've made progress. We continue to make progress, but we see more work ahead. And then on the marketing front, um, you know, we're continuing to expand and strengthen our portfolio, um, both with new clients, but also with signed up prospects. Those are folks who have given us all their information but have not converted, um, as well as reactivation. And so, you know, we are always super disciplined with how we spend, you know, um, in that sort of 9 to 10% range and are making sure that we are getting a return on any investment we make um, and we'll keep broadening that portfolio. Um, on the beyond 2023, kind of beyond this fiscal year, I mean, if you think about it, Stitch Fix is still a pretty small business in an enormous um, apparel market. You know, we're about a $2 billion company in a $400 billion U.S. only addressable market. And we know that by opening up the freestyle experience together with Fixes, that has both created incrementality within our existing client base, but we believe at 2 to 3x um, times increases the TAM of being a fix only business. So we're just incredibly focused this year on continuing to improve the customer experience, get on that positive um, net active track, which we do expect to turn the corner on net active clients um, sequentially over the course of at some point in FY23, um, and just ensuring we have the stable foundation of profitability to build on beyond this year. Okay, great. Thanks for the help. We will take our next question from Corey Carpenter with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks for the question. Just um, maybe to start on freestyle, could you talk about your priorities for freestyle specifically this year? And you know, are you, how much of your marketing spend do you expect to deploy against freestyle? And then related to that, um, last quarter you made the decision to direct new customer traffic to the fixed flow exclusively. Is that still the case in um, any plans to to redirect some of that back to, to freestyle in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Corey, for the question. Um, you know, we continue to make in improvements in the freestyle experience. You know, we had talked um, in the last quarter or two around search, and that's become, you know, that was one of our most asked for features with clients. Um, that has done well. Um, doing things like beta testing, seeing outfits in search, um, just continuous improvement of really integrating more of our styling-led differentiation, you know, those three areas that we think we do better than anybody else that are really solving the hardest problems of fit, discovery, and human relationship, you know, really our ambition is to just make that more and more integrated in the freestyle um, experience and really this blurring of the fix and freestyle offering. Um, we know our, our best, happiest clients are engaging with both and just making it easier to be um, participating across that full, that full ecosystem. Um, you know, if you were to Google search a particular item, you can land on a product detail page or a category page and start right with freestyle. But our core front door experience, we're really focused on just getting people into our full ecosystem. And um, what we found is starting with a fix is a great entry point. And so we're very focused there right now just because we like what we're seeing, but we'll continue to experiment with that throughout the year. Um, we do acquire clients through kind of landing on product detail pages, but I'd say our core customer activation focus is really through um, starting with the full ecosystem and starting with the fix right now. Thank you. 
We will take our next question from Simeon Siegel with BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Thanks. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry if I missed it, but did you say how we should think about the go-forward clients versus our pack embedded within the 1Q and full-year revenue guides? And maybe just speak to the comfort in the improvement embedded over the year. Thanks. Simeon, can you just clarify the question? Are you asking what we expect on active clients, or what are you asking? Yeah, that, yeah, just any context. Within the, you gave the revenue guides for the first quarter and the full year, so any context on how that breaks down between price versus clients? Got it. Yeah, we, didn't, we don't guide specifically to actives. As I mentioned um, in the response a, a moment ago, we do anticipate at some point over the course of this year turning the corner on improvement in um, positive net actives. I mean, simply by virtue of the fact that we're starting the year with 3.8 million versus over 4 million clients, that just has a really big impact on the absolute revenue for the, for the year. So that is really the biggest driver. And as you know, like as we acquire clients, they're spending builds over time. And so we're just not gonna see the benefit of that impact. Um, but let me pause there and see if Dan, anything to add on that in terms of how it translates to revenue. No, I, the only thing I'd add on uh, the active clients and RPAC, um, you know, I, I did say in the earlier remarks that while net actives will be down for Q1, they'll be down less so than the Q3 to Q4 sequential change that we saw in FY22. And so, um, you know, as we get closer to adding net active clients, that will likely have the impact of bringing RPAC down simply because these newer clients aren't on our platform long enough. Um, to spend uh, disproportionate to clients that are uh, that have been here uh, and spending on a on a regular cadence with us. So that's the way we think about our pack here. So uh, again, as we continue to diminish the decline in net actives and ultimately start to grow net actives, I would expect our pack to be impacted by that. But it will have a net positive, of course, on revenue as subsequent fixes and subsequent um, engagement with Freestyle take on with our newer clients. Great. And then just given the strength of the data that you have, are there any learnings between the clients that have lapsed? So so is there any, I don't know if there's age, demographic, shopping tendency, like just you guys have a wealth of data. So as you look at the cohorts or you look at the groups that have, um, have peeled off, anything that you can learn from that? Yeah, I mean, I would say a few things in general. Our clients are the happiest when they feel like we heard their preferences and we responded accordingly and present the right product at the right time, which, you know, we get, a, we get right a lot of the time, but we don't always get it right. And so our ability to um, immediately address, you know, if we didn't get it right through, um, a, you know, redoing their fix experience or connecting them with a stylist, like that's actually a lot of what we're going to be focused on this year is bringing more of that um, stylist front and center and that active listening, I mean, it is a big part of what has made us so successful. And so using that data to um, both uh, reactivate clients, which we actually have a pretty healthy reactivation rate, we see more upside there, it was actually positive year on year, our reactivations of FY22 versus FY21, actually entirely driven by growth and freestyle. And so, you know, what we believe is uh, the broadening variety of our assortment, the broadening of price points, all of those good things um, will benefit the broader client population over time. But ultimately, it's that sense of a client feeling, you know, deeply heard and we put the right product in front of them at the right time. And so anytime we have, you know, that signal of where we can improve it is where we're focused, you know, both frankly with our active clients as well as with lap clients. And, and just to add so on, on to that, I, I will say it's not a learning, but it is uh, for us because we've known it for a while. It is worth reiterating is, you know, our, our, our clients' uh, desire to get fit right, which we do very well, is really important, um, and they love that. Uh, we've talked about fit a lot in prior calls, and it's just worth repeating how important that is um, and, and how we focus on that and, you know, continue to try to get better and better at fit. Great. Thanks. Best of luck for the rest of the year. Thanks, Simeon. We will take our next question from Mark Altschwager with Baird. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Amy Teske on for Baird. Um, beyond the broader apparel pullback, I was hoping you would dig in a little bit more into consumer behavior changes, uh, what you're seeing in terms of box frequency, keep rates, average sales price, and any details you can provide on trends in specific product categories. 
Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, you know, I think we do a lot of research of what consumers are asking for. Um, we get signal on, you know, the majority of our fixes, of where the preferences are, and then, of course, we're always tracking what average unit retails and what price points are resonating. And, um, you know, I would say a couple things. First, on just like category trends, we've definitely seen that continued shift back um, to workwear, both with our men's and our women's segments. Um, blazers are back to pre-COVID levels, you know, men's polos have been a strong trend. Um, so we are seeing kind of category trends that we've, you know, thankfully been prepared for. I will say that consumers are telling us they are feeling more um, cash constrained. You know, we have different um, experiences within freestyle, you know, where we highlight items under 50. And in general, we have seen our price points that are at more affordable average unit retails. Um, outperforming, which is a strong signal that consumers are looking for value right now. Um, and then we do ask our clients about sort of their anticipated spending going forward, and we have heard clients, you know, both in serving consumers in the UK and the US, that they may be buying fewer items per fix in the future, and so we're just really preparing to have the right product at the right time. I'm, I think, thankfully, in our business, over half of it are clients who are getting you know, auto shipment with fixes, but we want to make sure that we're providing the value for them in this moment. Um, we'll also be beta testing later this year um, some new loyalty-based programs, and so our focus is really just making sure we're both providing right product, right time, and rewarding loyalty and value with our customers. Um, and that early signal that we get is incredibly valuable to make sure we have the right product. Very helpful. Thank you. We will take our next question from Edward Yoroma with Piper Sandley. Sandler, please go ahead. Hey guys, thanks very much for taking my question. I guess twofold. First, you know, I know you've been pretty tactical with SGA reductions, but if you could kind of help us just understand fixed versus variable SGA, particularly in light of what could be a tougher demand environment. And then as a follow up to that, I just want to understand um, the markdown reserves that are embedded um, it, uh, on the inventory right now. How should we think about that? Are, are they kind of trued up at this point? Was there a true up in the quarter? Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Ed. Um, let me hand that one to, to Dan to answer both of those. Yeah, I, uh, on, on the SG&A reduction, you know, as we said earlier, we are on track to achieve the high end, uh, to exceed the high end of the 40 to 60 million that we talked about last quarter. The bulk of that is, is, in, is in fixed. Uh, which is what we targeted from a cost reduction standpoint. I, I will say, though, that um, on the variable side, uh, which is our uh, warehouse, our selling, and our, our uh, sorry, our stylist and our customer service, we've seen uh, improvement, quite a bit improvement quarter on quarter in, in that area as well um, across our variable nature. So we feel really good about our SG&A costs and the continuing leverage that we get both on fixed and variable. Uh, I think they're both, uh, we, we're going to see leverage on both in, in FY23. Uh, that's the answer uh, to your first question. And to your second question on inventory reserves, as, we, as I talked about earlier, we did increase our inventory reserves primarily for excess spring and summer uh, goods of uh, good inventory. Um, we, uh, you know, we are looking, um, we do expect the back half of FY23 to improve our inventory position. Um, a lot of that depends, of course, on the macro environment, but, you know, we do feel like we have hit the top end of that reserve, and uh, we're not expecting uh, in increases in reserves going forward simply because we're, going, we're focused very much on right-sizing our inventory. Um, we feel very good about the fall and winter inventory that we've got coming in, and um, at this point, um, I think we're in a good position from an, an inventory reserve perspective. Thank you. We will take our next question from Lauren Shank with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Great, thank you. I guess as we think about the factors that are that are weighing on net ads, is traffic really the biggest headwind, uh, followed by conversion and then churn, or, or how should we think about kind of the different factors within net ads? And then any update on on what percentage of fixed customers have uh, tried freestyle or made more than one purchase on freestyle? I know you've given some of those stats in the past. Thanks so much. Hey, Lauren, thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, you know, I mentioned on the call that we saw steady improvements um, in traffic in the back half of FY22, and so we like the progress we're seeing. We've also made progress on conversion. 
Um, you know, our best traffic is that sort of direct and organic traffic, and that's what we're continuing to push and make progress on. You know, I think we all just saw a huge, you know, rush to e-commerce a couple years ago. Some of that has leveled back off, and so our ability to just um, continue to strengthen the mix of our marketing portfolio and sort of, you know, continue to expand our um, toolkit there beyond what we'll say a pretty heavily growth marketing focus a couple years ago. So we like the progress we're seeing, still have more to do. You know, that first multinational campaign that we just launched, we think is going to help build consideration, things like our new affiliate influencer network. So it's really a combination, I would say, of continuing to improve high quality traffic sources, bringing back in um, clients that we can reactivate together with um, continued uh, kind of continued gains in the conversion funnel, which we you know, have gotten back to levels that we were at in the past, but we still see more upside by just making it more frictionless and seamless to enter. Um, so I would say it's really a combination of the two. And then on your um, fix into freestyle, you know, I'd say that stayed at pretty heavy levels. I think we've reported in the past um, that, you know, it resonates with around a fifth of clients um, that come back again and again if they're a freestyle first purchaser. I think you're asking, though, specifically how many of our fixed clients um, get into freestyle, and um, I think we've shared in the past something like around 30% of our women's clients um, we've penetrated with freestyle, and that's remained steady, um, which we believe is below full potential, frankly, and we're looking for the next ways to kind of reduce what I would say is the cognitive load of a brand new fixed uh, customer learning about freestyle and just continuing to make that easier and easier. You know, as an example, in every fix we send, we have these ways to wear it uh, style cards that we send in a fix. You know, we, we see a future of just making those incredibly easy to buy with the fixed checkout process as an entry point into freestyle. So essentially just finding that next frontier of ways of moving that um, a further step change. But I'd say it's been pretty steady um, at that level to date, but we don't think it's full potential. Thank you. We will take our next question from David Bellinger with MKM Partners. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks for taking my questions. I've, I've got a couple. So my first one, just on the guidance, it seems like there's some active client growth embedded in the back half of the year. So what gives you the confidence that the clients will rebound? Is, is there anything you're seeing into Q1 on traffic or conversion to support that? And then it's my, my second one. So RPAC expected to be down again in Q1. And understanding the dynamic you spoke about earlier that you know initial users aren't spending much right away, but are you seeing anything beyond that? Anything on average order values or some type of trade down effect or mix shift uh, that's affecting that RPAC number? Thanks. Got it. Thanks, David. I'll um, I'll take the first one and then I'll let Dan talk more about RPAC. Um, yeah, I mean, I think all of the things that we mentioned on the prepared remarks and some of what um, I've responded with in the last few questions, just the initiatives and the progress we're making on, you know, continued improvement on onboarding. Um, continued focus on bringing our signed up prospects, reactivation, new traffic channels into our experience. Um, and so, you know, we are making progress and, you know, based on what we're seeing and based on what we believe will be um, kind of laughing on a year-on-year -year basis, we anticipate that over the course of this year we will turn the corner. Um, on the RPAC side, let me hand it to, to Dan to share more on that. Yeah, a couple of a couple of comments uh, on um, the behavior of our clients who are purchasing. Um, of course, um, you know uh, the average age, uh, the average tenure of our client has increased uh, as a result of our net active declines. And so, when that happens, the um, the older clients tend to have a slightly lower keep rate than newer clients, simply because their closets get filled up over the course of you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 fixes. Um, but we are still seeing a very solid keep rates and AOVs in both fix and freestyle on the new clients coming in um, on, on a relative basis. So there's nothing, um, you know, Elizabeth had talked about potentially, you know, some impact. And, and we do see it um, around, um, around the fringes on the clients that come in. They might be lower priced clients. But when you look at it holistically, the AOVs, both for fix and freestyle on a cohort basis of the new clients coming in, still look very strong. Got it. Thank you. We will take our next question from Trevor Young with Barclays. Please go ahead. 
Great, thanks. Dan, on the full year guide, can you help us understand how you're thinking about that revenue growth cadence throughout the year in light of the down 20% in 1Q and the easing compares? It sounded like 1H under pressure, <clears throat> maybe some inventory overhang, kind of challenging holiday, but then maybe second half is improved. And what would need to go right for you to exit the year in positive growth territory? Yeah, it's a good question. And so, um, you know, in Q1 of last year, we had a very strong quarter. We were up 18% year on year. Uh, that, is a, is a, that is at the time that we started to see uh, the, um, the, you know, the, the issues with our uh, fixed funnel that we've discussed many times. But the impact of subsequent fixes gave us a very strong quarter. Uh, we see, you know, we have a, an easier comparative in the, you know, as we go forward with an FY23, that coupled with, um, you know, our, our net actives declining uh, at a far slower rate. And as Elizabeth mentioned, you know, we do hope, we do have goals and hope to get to, and we'll get to sequential improvement in net actives in a quarter this year. All that means that the growth rates that we see in the back half of the year will improve relative to the growth rates that we see in the first half of the year. It's, it, with response to your second question, what do we have to see to exit the year? Um, we talked about net actives growing, um, and as we as we go through quarter by quarter and see net active improve, net actives improve, we do think we'll end the year in a very strong position. In the meantime, you know, as you could see from our EBITDA guide, our cost structure, we're very focused on that, both in Q1 and full year. And so, given our focus on fixed and variable costs. Uh, we feel that uh, we will end Q4 um, and the back half of FY23 in a strong position. Great, thank you. We will take our next question from Mike Borachow with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, everyone. I was, just two quick ones. Um, I think you said the, the freestyle was up 21% in Q4. Can you just say specifically what the, what the subscription business was down in Q4? And then, Dan, on the gross margin, can you, can you walk us through uh, the reserve impact to gross margin, like how we should basically think about the puts and takes on gross margin for next year? I, I think you said it's 42% for Q1 and the full year. Should there be much volatility for, for the remaining, you know, Q2 to Q4, or should, should this be pretty much 42%, you know, almost every quarter through, just send any variability to, to call out? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ike. I can take um, the first one, and then Dan can add on and, and talk about gross margin. That freestyle growth rate, just to clarify, was our full year FY22 growth rate, not a Q4 growth rate. And on our full year basis, we were about negative 1% for the total business. We don't actually break out by business unit, but I, you can infer from that that there was growth in freestyle and slight decline within the fixed business. I mean, overall, it's really just this function of getting um, the net active growth back on track. And, you know, we, we entered the year of FY22 with more clients than we exited. And so that's a big driver of that fixed number. Um, and then just, you know, continued adoption and rollout of freestyle, which we know has been um, largely accretive and incremental to our existing fixed client base. Um, let me let Dan uh, comment on the, the gross margin question. Yeah, Mike, to your question uh, on gross margin, you know, we, we talked, I, we referenced it earlier that once you adjust for our incremental inventory reserve and third-party uh, third party liquidation sales, Q4 was at 42.5%. Uh, we guided for Q1 to be 42 in full year. Uh, we feel good about uh, our overall product margins. Uh, we feel good about all our gross margin line items. The one caveat, of course, is just the timing of inventory. A lot of our inventory, most of our inventory that we will receive in uh, our first half was ordered six months ago. We ordered inventory early because of supply chain challenges back then. A lot of those supply chain challenges have since alleviated. So the timing of the inventory um, is a little bit uncertain as we go into our H1 for our fall winter. And that could create some variability, but we do expect the 42% to be consistent quarter on quarter absent of any inventory surprises, which, which at this point we're managing quite closely. So you can infer that the 42% is relatively stable. Uh, pending some small changes quarter on quarter. Got it, thank you. We will take our next question from Ashley Helgens with Jeffries. Please go ahead. 
Hey, thanks for taking our questions. Uh, just on the fiscal year guide, what kind of macro backdrop are you assuming throughout fiscal year 23? And then a lot of retailers have been talking about higher promotions heading into the back half of the year. Can you update us on your promotional strategy now that you have the ability to use Freestyle as a promotional tool? Thanks. Yeah, I can start. Um, thanks for the questions, Ashley. I'll start with the promotional kind of behavior and then let Dan uh, talk about the full year um, guide expectations. So, yeah, I mean, when we were a fixed only business, we really had no release valve or promotional offerings for our clients, um, with the exception of our, our buy five discount, which obviously has been very popular with our customers. Over the course of the last eight months or so, we've been able to experiment um, with a couple limited time offers where we're, you know, taking advantage of showing value to our freestyle clients, um, as well as testing and experimenting um, with inventory that's not moving as quickly. So we had the first of those back in, um, I think it was in Q, late Q2, early Q3, um, and then again uh, within Q4, and then we also did a Labor Day event um, a few weeks ago. And you know, overall, we like what we've seen. Those events have exceeded our expectations. Um, you know, in certain situations, we really like the ability to drive Halo to the rest of our products. And so, you know, we are going to be really thoughtful to do these episodically, deliver value to our clients. We know the reason people come to Stitch Fix are different than you know being a promotional retailer, and those are the places we need to most differentiate, which are around fit, product discovery, and human relationships. That said, we also want to make sure we're presenting our clients with value um, and benefits over time. So we anticipate continuing to use those kinds of events, I would imagine, probably around the cadence of once a quarter um, with maybe some experimenting along the way. I think one thing that's really unique about the freestyle experience is that each store is unique to each of our clients. And so over time, as we build more of our pricing capabilities, more of our loyalty capabilities, um, being more even one-to-one -one focused in nature with what we offer to our clients is an opportunity down the road. Um, but overall, you know, we now have this uh, release valve that we wouldn't have had with a fixed-only business. I'll let Dan talk about um, the full-year question. Uh, yeah, Ashley, to your question on our full-year, uh, I would say that we have not factored in any deep uh, improvements or deep um, changes from where we're at now based on just on the, visit, the, the visibility we currently have. So it's, it's basically a status quo on where we're at now and what we feel is uh, the right guidance to give on everything that we know now and what we've seen over the last you know, several months uh, with our trends. Great, thanks for the color. We will take our next question from Tom Nickick with Wedbush Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hey, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I, I want to follow up on Ike's question earlier about the uh, gross margins. Um, you know, Dan, for uh, for 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 many many years, uh, this was a business that had gross margins kind of in the in the mid 40s, and you know now you know you've kind of been in the low 40s, like the 42 percent range, you know, the last couple quarters, and that's the guide for FY 23. Is this essentially like the new, you know, gross margin for the company long term? Uh, are there opportunities to take the gross margins higher? Like what? Uh, how do, how do we think about? Um, you know, puts and takes on gross margin, and like, can can you get back to that kind of mid 40s uh, gross margin that the company had, you know, for you know for for many years uh, if, before the recent quarters? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Tom. You know, the sequential uh, changes that you're talking about. You know, we're in H1 of FY22, we were closer to the 45 percent, and in H2, we were closer to the 42 percent is really, um, as I said earlier, the result of inflationary costs um, from a product standpoint, along with transportation costs, which uh, is well documented on the increase that um, uh, that's going on in the form of the uh, from the carriers. Uh, and so while we do expect that to continue on in FY23, there are opportunities to ultimately grow and improve margin. Um, for example, I, we've talked about this in the past. Our, our network is not uh, optimized yet to uh, have the lowest amount of transportation costs from a carrier or split shipments perspective. Uh, these are things that we're working on currently. And so 
Um, in these areas that are the biggest drivers of gross margin, mainly transportation and product costs, there, there is opportunity, um, you know, should the inflationary environment reside or, you know, as we get better and better with transportation and optimizing our, our carrier networks. Um, and again, that's, that's more longer term. Uh, so I wouldn't say that the 42% is the normal uh, going into FY24 or 25, and we'll look at that and update the uh, update you guys as we get closer to the end of the year. But um, for now, 42% is more of the realistic, just given the inflationary costs that we're seeing in both transportation and on the product side. Understood. Thanks, Dan. We will take our next question from Kunal Mathukar with UBS. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, let's start with uh, you know the the traffic increase that you talked about. So you said there is a steady improvement in traffic in this back half. Uh, conversion rates also improved, and yet uh, you know a couple of things. One is uh, your uh, you know your LTM active client number declined significantly, high single digits on a year over year basis, uh, and you are also talking about the average age of the client base has increased which means you're retaining some of the older customers. So what am I missing here? You're, you're, probably, you're, you're probably adding more customers, and yet you have more uh, older customers. Uh, who did you lose, and why is the LTM number down? And then I have a quick follow-up. Hey, thanks, Kunal. Yeah, I did mention that we saw steady gains in the back half uh, relative to earlier in the year on traffic, and then we have made progress on conversion, so those are both true. Conversion rates are obviously different depending on the source of traffic and channel. And so, you know, we like what we're seeing on driving more um, to the experience. The area that we still have room to improve is that direct and organic traffic, which, which tends to be the highest converting traffic. So while on an apples to apples basis, we've made steady progress on conversion, you know, we still see opportunity to drive that really high considered traffic that has super high intent um, on coming to Stitch Fix. So areas of opportunity that we're very focused on are those signed up prospects who've already come and given their information but not converted, you know, increasing um, the penetration of those customers we see as a big opportunity, you know, reactivating prior clients where they know, you know, they found what they needed in the past but maybe lapsed over time and bringing them back. Um, and then things like um, I mentioned, like, you know, the early um, efforts to begin to scale our affiliate influencer. So all of those tend to drive, um, especially the former, that very high intent traffic. So not all traffic is apples to apples as part of what you're hearing. And then on the 10-year point, you know, we just have not added the same magnitude of new customers is really the core issue. It's not that it's a different customer base. It's more we just haven't had the same order of magnitude of new customers, which early in life cycle, clients just tend to spend more with us than over, you know, say the two to three year time frame, their spend tends to go down a bit. Um, and so those are the dynamics that I think you're hearing. Uh, okay. I don't know, Dan, add anything to that? No, I think um, I'll, I'll just add on to what Elizabeth said, uh, which I fully agree with in that once we do turn the corner and, and add net actives, that average tenure uh, will come back down. Um, and we will see that impact over the subsequent timelines as these new customers engage more with fix and freestyle uh, over their over their tenure. So we would expect that trend to reverse when we add new actives. Got it. And the follow-up is on freestyle. So freestyle started uh, in the middle of last fiscal year, effectively. And so if it started virtually from scratch in the middle of last fiscal year, uh, you know, and maybe had six to nine months of, uh, you know, revenue, and then it grew 21%. So did it grow from like, you know, 4% of total revenue to, uh, you know, 10% of total revenue or, you know, how big is Freestyle right now? Yeah, I can start and Dan, feel free to add. So um, Kunal, we actually began an experience of being able to shop your looks, shop um, items you'd bought in the past, fixed experience um, kind of late in fiscal 20. And then um, we started to ramp up more features and that shopping experience in fiscal 21, um, just as an add-on feature for existing clients. And we've continued to build out more features and functionality, and we'll continue to do so. It was just in last fiscal year um, of FY22 that we made it possible that you could start with that experience. 
So it was not brand new halfway through last year, but the features and the expansion and the branding of Freestyle happened last fall. Got it. And we Thank you so much. And we don't much. break out. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Cool. We will take our next question from Janet Klopenberg with KJK Research Associates. Please go ahead. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I just had a couple follow-on questions about um, merchandising execution and um, the inventory content. I was just wondering, you talked about the where to work trends being good, and um, I, I, I think that might be helping drive the average spend per customer, not sure, but wondering if you feel like your inventory investments there are where they should be or if they're improving now and that's helping um, drive the improved performance that you're seeing right now. Maybe if you could talk a little bit about, you know, your investments and in where to work in special occasion versus casual and trends you're seeing there and also on the men's performance because I know that that uh, gender had, had been weaker than women's. And just lastly, Dan, on the inventory, I know you're comfortable that it's coming down. I'm just wondering, again, on content and seasonal carryover, particularly due to late deliveries of summer, maybe because of supply chain delays, and how that looks going forward. Thank you. Yeah, Janet, I can start on the, the merchandising. I mean, we, we definitely have seen particular strength recently in just, um, you know, categories that frankly have been less popular during the COVID timeframe are really starting to come back. Um, as I mentioned, you know, blazers being a good example of that. In women's, we also saw like a 30% increase in seasonal heels. You know, clearly people are going um, back uh, into the work environment, even if it's hybrid work. Things like dresses has continued to be strong, um, particular types of dresses like midi and maxi. And then with men's, things that are versatile like polo shirts have continued to show strength. But I would say like athleisure, comfortable clothes, those tend to still be very strong categories for us. And so it's really the portfolio products that I think have um, benefited us and that we've kind of played across. You know, we're not just athleisure, we're not just workwear, we're really able to adapt to the signal that we're hearing from our clients. And, you know, over the course of this last year, we did add a number of national brands that we've tested into, um, but the majority of our sales are still with kind of the combination of Stitch Fix only and private label that we're able to adapt reasonably quickly based on um, client preference. Um, obviously, some categories are longer lead time like footwear. So I would say we're seeing kind of continued um, consumer demand and things like athleisure in addition to workwear, so it's not just a, a full-on shift to the, those categories. Um, and you're, like and you're comfortable that are you comfortable that your inventories are aligned in um, in sync with the with the category demand? I think we're feeling like we have the right presence of categories. I think like most of our category, just the overall discretionary investment is what I think kind of all of apparel is probably experiencing right now. But in terms of having you know, affordable price points, having the categories that consumers are looking for. I think probably the bigger headwind within, you know, retail apparel overall is just the shift that consumers are making given inflation, gas prices. I think it's more of a macro than a micro. Um, and let me, I know you have the supply chain um, speed question. Thanks so much. Um, take that one. I uh, yeah, the question on uh, the spring and summer uh, goods, that was uh, the reason we gave uh, when we talked um, about the uh, 250 basis point impact on the gross margin mm -hmm. from 40% uh, right. that we had in Q4. Um, I feel very good about the spring and summer goods uh, in, form of, in the form of uh, we've adequately reserved for that. Uh, we've actually executed uh, quite a bit on, um, on right-sizing that inventory. I, I will say, of course, the uh, supply chain issues as it relates to uh, fall and winter is where we're focused on now. A lot of those orders were placed six months ago, and so we, we have one more cycle here uh, before we feel we can right-size our inventory, and I would expect inventory to go up sequentially um, you know, in Q1, uh, although we're, we're still working on, on right-sizing that inventory. So for the spring-summer, I feel very good. Uh, and I also feel pretty good. I feel very good about the back half that we'll have our inventory right-sized by the back half of our FY23. 
Okay, thanks so much. I'll, I'll follow up on it later. We will take our next question from Dana Telsey with Telsey Advisory Group. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone. Just following up on Janet's question on inventory, you talk about right size in the inventory. What levels do you expect it to, to be, and is there a marker for the first half of the fiscal year and by the end of the fiscal year as you're looking at it? And then on expense reduction, which I believe last quarter you had talked about the 40 to $60 million annual cost savings. How is that progressing? And the one-time restructuring charges of 15 to $20 million in this past fourth quarter, is that done or is there anything more we should look at? And then just Elizabeth on product, um, as you think about planning for the holiday season, what are you leaning into? What are you seeing from brands, from your own private label, and how do you expect that mix to shape? Thank you. Great. I'll let Dan take the first couple of questions. Uh, yeah, hi, Dana. On, on to your first question, um, you know, we don't provide a, a forecast for inventory. That said, you know, we, we feel that we can get in excess, you know, upwards of, of four to five times uh, turns on a, on a gross inventory basis. We're not there now, but we feel ultimately we eventually can get to that level. That's probably longer term. Uh, but we're making good progress, or we plan to make good progress throughout FY23 on right-sizing our inventory and keeping it at the right uh, right level of turns on a go-forward basis. And we'll update you more in uh, future earnings calls on where we're at with respect to our inventory position. On the on the cost uh, on the cost savings initiative, when um, we mentioned last quarter that 40 to 60 million is what we expected to receive. Uh, we are on track, as we said earlier, to exceed that number. Uh, we'll, most of that, you know, a, a lot of it is operationalized. There's still a lot of initiatives that we have that we're working on. So we'll give an update on what that is going to be as we go through FY23. But uh, I feel very good on the 40 to 60, on exceeding that 60 million threshold. The, the bulk of that um, is on the fixed cost side. Uh, on top of that, we are uh, expecting to get variable productivity for a lot of the work that we did in um, um, in Q4 uh, on both the warehouse and the styling side of the business, uh, and so that will help uh, in the cost savings initiative going forward. And then finally, to uh, your um, uh, question on the restructuring charges, we may have small amounts of restructuring. Um, we don't anticipate anything uh, for Q1 as big as Q4. There might be some small restructuring and, and one-time charge initiatives. We'll update you guys on that as we, uh, as we go into Q2. Um, but it will not be like it was, of course, in Q4. Um, again, stay tuned on, on restructuring and one-time charges. Um, and then I can just mention, I think, Dana, you're asking questions of some of the trends we're seeing on our assortment and heading into the holiday season. Um, I would just say broadly, you know, we've learned a lot on sort of the discovery um, within Freestyle of some of the brands that we've added. And in particular, I think we've seen um, popularity with contemporary brands with accessible price points and limited distribution. You know, some of our top brands that we've seen in freestyle have been brands like Modern Citizen, Vera Moda. You know, brands are basically priced at that sweet spot of under $150. Um, in addition to um, particular strength in a number of our exclusive brands, um, you know, Market and Spruce and 41 Hawthorne continue to be um, some of the biggest brands within our portfolio, both fix and freestyle. Um, you know, I think we're hearing in terms of client signal in our request notes are, you know, going out again and preparing for the holiday season. We are more of a self-purchase occasion still rather than gifting, so our focus is probably going to be on that in terms of, you know, dresses and going out wear, and we're ready for that. Um, so thank you for that question. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. Ms. Spalding, I'd like to turn the conference back to you for any additional or closing remarks. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today and all the questions. We look forward to updating you on our progress. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.